have him here. Um, so unlike the May talk, I'd like to encourage participation. If you see a slide and you know it brings back a memory, um, many of you are older than I am and might recognize some of the people or have a story to tell, I encourage you to do that because um, I really appreciate the give and take and I think it makes the whole experience uh, better for all. Okay, so let's see if I can do this. So we're going up or down? Apparently down. Nowhere. Point down direction. <laughs> okay, so from grain elevators to hatchery, Petaluma's agricultural history is told through its architecture. What does that mean? Um, well, actually, it's a, it's a fancy way to say that Petaluma has a number of buildings that were constructed for an agricultural purpose. Their existence reminds us of our city's roots, as well as our current economy in many instances, because a lot of these buildings are still being used for their agricultural purposes. They also serve as a unique visual landmark that provide Petaluma with an identity that goes hand in hand with our lovely Victorian downtown and residential architecture. Tonight, I'll share a bit of history that led to the construction of these buildings, some of which are long gone, some still being used for their original purpose. Yeah, and you could always look over here, Joe. <laughs> the smaller version. Um, that are, what's that? I'm sorry. Okay, peanut gallery. <laughs> Put you here because I, I wanted you to support me. Um, it's great. Okay. Some of which are long gone, some of which are being used for their original purposes, such as. Um, well, I can't have, I don't know, three hands, such as the Dairyman's Feed here, um, or not currently used, such as the Western Hatchery. Um, and some have been rehabilitated for a new use. I'll also touch on how these buildings are often a subject for art. Okay, but first we're going to go back a little bit and put um, Petaluma's agricultural past in context with Petaluma's history. Excuse me, with California's history. Between 1850 and 1870, California's population increased by about 500,000, partially in response to the gold rush. Here, gold rush. <laughs> this population surge created greater demands of food products, for food products and associated service industries, which in turn allowed farmers and mer merchants alike to prosper. Uh, and by the way, most of the photos come from the Sonoma County Library, where I work in the History and Genealogy Collection. Um, and then in instances where I've used photos from other sources, I've noted them. Um, so with this surge in population, created greater demands of food. Um, many of the crops that were being raised in, in uh, California between 1850 and 70 included grains, wheat, and barley, which led to the construction of grain mills and warehouses throughout California, including one right here in Petaluma. This was the McNear Warehouse, which would have been on the site of what's now the, um, well, it's not called the Golden Eagle Milling, Golden Eagle Shopping Center anymore, um, but you all know what I'm talking about. So this would be the typical kind of warehouse built between the 1850s and 70s. Um, McNear also had a flour mill located on Petaluma Boulevard North, or Main Street, it was, as it was called, called the Oriental Flour Mill, starting in the 1860s. And so here we have a historic view, also a historic view, but that one, um, I think you can pretty much identify where that building was from that image. Wheat production in Sonoma County reached its peak during the 1870s, and decline uh, slowly through the remainder of the century. In 1880, about 29,000 tons of wheat were shipped down the Petaluma River, whereas by 1892, we see a decline with only 16,000 tons being shipped. And this would be the type of schooner that would be hauling uh, grain. Oh, I'm sorry, Diane, you can't back up. <clears throat> Just, you know, kind of nervous about these guns back here, though. <laughs> um, Catherine, was that the turning basin, that last photo? Oh. Yeah. Yes. Is 
That would be the turning basin. And we'll have several more like that. Um, okay, so with uh, wheat kind of going down, um, we have other products emerging, such as the cultivation of fruit, specialty crops such as hops and nuts played an important role. In um, 1880, 81 tons of wool were shipped down the Petaluma River, much of it coming from the Petaluma Woolen Mills, which was on um, Copeland and East D Street. Um, upper right photo is sort of to depict canning of fruit. Um, and then we actually had a brewery here, uh, the U.S. brewery that was located on Upham Street. So a lot going on in town. Um, now, dairy products were another important California and Sonoma County export. In the 1860 Sonoma County Livestock Census lists a preponderance of dairy cows over beef about uh, 5,300 compared to 3,500. Milch cows, as they were called, provided an important source of income. The cows were milked only from December or January until early June when the green feed disappeared, with the milk being home processed into butter and cheese for both local and commercial production. And so we have butter being made up in the t upper slides there. Turning Basin again. Um, here you kind of have to use your imagination because this slide, this picture was probably taken in the teens and I'm going to tell you that this is about 1870. Um, but, you know, just to give you the flavor. The schooner would be there, but maybe not the buildings. Um, 1870, we have about 187,000 pounds of butter, 1,621 pounds of cheese being shipped out of Petaluma. And that the whole thing will not be numbers. <laughs> We're just getting, just getting the background here. Did, did you have a question? No. Okay. Ah, oh, and I'm so sorry that um, Margaret and George aren't here. Um, in, uh, during the 1870s, the dairy industry rapidly changed due to an influx of immigrants from Holland, Denmark, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Ireland, and the Azores. So this would be a typical dairy ranch. As with this, this picture gets used quite a bit, so that might be familiar to you. So these um, immigrants were attracted by the accessibility to markets, the climate. Um, these newcomers immediately became aware of Petaluma's advantages as a dairy center. And by the 1880s, when supplemental feeding came into practice, Petaluma was the largest shipping Point in the state for dairy products. At the same time that this was all going on, um, Petaluma is getting a reputation as the egg basket of the world, thanks to a Jewish dentist named Isaac Diaz, a Canadian medical student, Lyman Weiss, and a Danish farmer named Christopher Nissen. And I don't have pictures of Diaz or um, Nissen, but we have loads of pictures of Lyman Weiss. He was quite the self-promoter, right up there with Luther Burbank, I think. Okay, Diaz and Weiss invented the first practical incubator in 1879, which Christopher Nissen seized upon within a few years and established the world's first commercial hatchery on his Two Rock Ranch, shown here. Okay, so maybe in there we might see Christopher Nissen. Um, I have a question. Yes. I understand that uh, Lyme Advice didn't really invent the incubator, but he improved on it so much that he sold it all over the world. I think, well, I mean, I think he invented it and marketed it all over the world. Did what you? he did, he put a control on it. So it takes 28 days for a hen to, for an egg to hatch. Mm -hmm. And by putting the control on it so that he can measure the time, that's how it became the incubator. Okay. Oh, great. But he made it work for him. He did. <laughs> yeah. And even today at the library, we'll occasionally get 
an inquiry from Australia or somebody saying, I found this incubator in my barn and it says Petaluma Incubator Company, what can you tell me about it? And, wow. and we have catalogs, I can actually look it up for them. <laughs> Pretty cool. And I can introduce you to his granddaughter if you want to be here. All right. Thank you, Millie. Where is she? <laughs> um, okay. So, um, so consequently, by 1885, at least 50 farms in the Petaluma area had purchased the newly invented incubator and were hatching baby chicks artificially. thanks to the Petaluma Incubator Company. And I, for those of you who have heard me talk, I always wax poetic about this picture. Um, I mean, what a different Petaluma we have today, or have here as opposed to today. Because this is basically Petaluma Boulevard. This would be what's the D Street Bridge when it was a, this is either a swing, a swing bridge or a, or, a, or a drawbridge. Is that a photo or a drawing? It's a drawing. Um, and here's the river when you could actually come up the river because in, in 1968 was when they uh, made it a fixed bridge and you can see then it's servicing all of these businesses back here the, one of the largest being the incubator company um, over here we're going to talk a little bit about the Golden Eagle Milling Company and I mean I love the smoke coming up and I mean, oh, excuse me is that the Washington Street Bridge then? yeah okay yeah um, so a very different place, and very much impacted by the incubator factory. So Washington Street or D Street? Washington. Well, Washington Street. Mm -hmm. Washington. Mm -hmm. So this would be kind of across the street from Henry Park, if I'm not mistaken. The foundations are still there. Yeah, the foundations are still there. You know where the parking area is, and there's some interesting walls and windows and things. Okay, so you had that, you had these inventions, and then you also had transportation. Here we have the, the San Francisco North Pacific Depot being constructed in 1871. Um, it would be roughly in the location of the Visitor Center. Um, this building, when they built what's now the Visitor Center in 1914, this building got moved on closer to D Street, and eventually, I think it burned down in the 1940s. But so you had the river, and now you have the railroad to um, get your products to market. And so what you see is warehouses being constructed, such as these. Um, this would be just south of the D Street Bridge. Now, architectural style was not always a consideration. Um, it was more about utilitarianism and, and being adaptable for how, you know, as, as the industry changed. We will see some examples of architectural you know, styles later on in the presentation. Um, probably the oldest surviving building associated with agriculture it, within the city limits is the old Petaluma Mill. And this was built according to, hang on here, let's see, um, Skip Summer who rehabilitated the mill in 1975. He dates the warehouse at 1854, saying that it was constructed initially to store um, meat for the hunters who came to Petaluma. The stone walls of the original building were one and a half feet thick, and no one knows what was used for roofing, but it was cold, cool enough for a few days of storage before the barges um, came up to the creek, which is what it was called at the time, to take the meat from to San Francisco and Sacramento. Now, other owners, as you can see from this um, Sanborn fire insurance map, were um, Wickersham, and we have Mr. Wickersham here in the audience somewhere, Marshall West, who, um, if you've ever taken a walking tour, there he is back there, Petaluma Museum, you may be walking with him. Um, also owned by um, A.L. Whitney, and then you can see what's great about these maps they tell you so much grain potatoes hop salt storage it's got a planked floor um, lots going on there and then what's interesting here is this would be now approximately where the parking lot where this section is here used to be the Union Hotel um, and then here's more and please note it says Petaluma Creek yes 
It does. <laughs> um, let's see here. Where are we? Okay. Um, we've seen the other owners. I kind of went crazy with pictures of this. Oops, not that one. Here it is in 1902 when G.P. McNair purchased it because he, remember his father had the mill down on the boulevard, the Oriental Mills, well that burned in 1905, or excuse me, 1902. And so then his son George established this, um, the business here at the corner of Petaluma Boulevard and B Street. Um, and what's kind of fun for anybody who's watching the discussions about Center Park, well here's Center Park right here where there's any trees. Um, so this would be B Street, and this would be the boulevard. I'm sorry, keep doing that. Um, okay, who knows their cars? What year do you think this is? 40s? Okay. You judge me by the street lights. Now Center Park's got a, a light pole, a little bit of grass. Um, and then here you see uh, McNear has really expanded his operation. He actually expanded it um, three times. Um, when he first took over in 1902, he added a uh, one and a half story brick building. Um, and then in 1919 and 1923, he made further additions, which you can kind of see how much the larger size it is now. Question over here. Yes. Is GEO a particularly common abbreviation for George, or was it rather? Yeah, yeah. I think so, yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Good to know. <laughs> okay. Um, I just like this picture. Watermelons, another crop. Um, and you can see the, so again, we're at the Turdine Basin, and this isn't, well, it is out of focus, but the, the photo itself is out of focus. But again, we have the Turning Basin. Um, at this point, I think it's just a wharf. I don't think this is the actual uh, trestle as we know it today, and then you can see back here. So this is all here still, which is kind of cool. Okay, I showed you that already. Okay, and then I like this picture a lot. This is the 1930s, and you can see how McNear has really taken advantage of not only the river, but rail, and of course he was instrumental in having the, what we know as the, the trestle that's in such bad repair right now, constructed in 1922. Um, so is that photo by Decker, or is it yes. the barge by Decker? The, the photo is by Decker, yeah, and you'll see like some others where he puts his little car, I mean, I guess, you know, you're advertising, basically. Okay, what happens next? Okay, so McNear, you know, and I, I'm hoping most of you know who George McNear is, because I could probably take a half an hour on explaining that. I happened to meet George McNear. Scared me to stiff. <laughs> <laughs> he always wore a vest. Yeah. Very austere, and I must have been 15 or something. Uh -huh. Very impressive man. Yeah. Uh, Diane, you want to move? Yeah. <laughs> Give me a chance to catch my thoughts. Um, yeah, so McNear, his father, and then George McNear, the son, owned a lot of Petaluma, involved in just about everything from real estate to feed mills to um, railroads, banking, etc. But with regard to agriculture, he had so many warehouses around town that he had to number them, which is very convenient for a researcher, because um, <laughs> you can figure out what's going on some of the time. Um, so here we have warehouse number 12 that was on um, First Street, and so you have both the river view and the street view. And what I like, this was built in the 1920s, and I think it's great that even today, 2012, it's still serving an agricultural purpose with cowgirl creameries and three twins ice cream occupying this building, which has been modified over the years. But that's the thing about these buildings historically. I mean, that's they're they're all about adaptability. They're not they're not static. Is it down or up? Down. Okay. So G. P. McNear was not the only game in town when it came to feed mills. There was also the Golden Eagle Milling Company. And I've had people ask me, well, was it also in the lumber business? Um, what you're seeing here is next door to the, the mill. So right now, this is what we know as Golden Eagle Shopping Center. And then over here, 
was Cavanaugh lumber, hence all the lumber. Um, and if you've ever noticed that, a lot of people don't even know it's a park, but next to the river house, there's the Cavanaugh Park, and it's named after Jack Cavanaugh of Cavanaugh lumber. Fun fact. Um, another Decker photo, yes, good eye. Maybe that should be the quiz. How many <laughs> Decker photos are there? Um, so the mill was located on the, okay, back up. Um, okay, the Golden Eagle Milling Company actually started out in 1885 as the Percival uh, Milling Company, and then it became the Golden Eagle Milling Company in 1888 under the new ownership of H.T. Fairbanks. Anybody familiar with the Fairbanks house on D Street? Yeah, same Fairbanks. And then his sons and grandsons, who were the Hills, later took over. Uh, they began with 50 barrel, uh, 50 barrel flour mill and eventually expanded to an extensive facility which covered eight acres of land. So, it's kind of hard to get your arms around here, but um, this is Washington Street, and we're right at about, you know, the bridge would be about here, and this was all Golden Eagle going up to the river. So what we saw here is the Riverside, obviously a different time period, but and then here's the Washington Street side. And then we have some workers and I guess, night, again, probably what, 1950s? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Golden Eagle at times had more than 100 employees and helped to promote the financial well-being of Petaluma and the surrounding area. The mill was located on the Petaluma River and had a spur track connections throughout its plant. And you see those using those um, Sanborn fire insurance maps I spoke of, um, making it very easy to get products in and out of Petaluma. And according to one source, the Golden Eagle Milling Company shipped out hundreds of tons of flour, feed, hay, grain, and poultry supplies daily in the 1920s. In 1959, Golden Eagle took over operation of the G.P. McNear plant across the river. And in 1964, abandoned its East Washington plant, which they demolished, in 1965. Use that sign today. Um, and so here's an aerial view from a few years ago of the same site. Okay, meanwhile, so they've taken over the mill across the, the turning basin, and then it catches on fire, July 4th, 1967. So just two years after they demolished their other mill. Um, what, was, what remained was rehabilitated, as mentioned earlier, by Skip Summer in 1975. So it sat in quite a disrepair for some time. And then here it is today. Okay, these weren't the only feed mills. We also had Parker and Gordon um, located on what we know today as Petaluma Boulevard North. And um, it's a great aerial view from about 1938. This is actually taken from the Dairyman's Feed looking down. So this is the boulevard, so you can probably recognize at least that building. Uh, but this would be the back side of, uh, well, most recently people probably know it as the Baby Warehouse, but that was what was Parker and Gordon and this big <coughs> it'll, it'll come more clear when we see a few other pictures. Um, here it is again. Then later it becomes Gillardi Furniture, but between Parker and Gordon and being Gillardi Furniture, it was a roller skating rink. Wow. Does know that? And um, I'm told uh, the building was torn, has been being torn down for quite some time, but some of that maple flooring has been salvaged and uh, is scattered around town in different remodel projects. Um, so here's some pictures I took in May. Um, and a lot's happened since then. And here it was this morning. Ah. <laughs> nice thing, a great view of Hunt Barrens now. Um, yeah. But pretty, pretty disheartening, despite the efforts to salvage materials. When you tear down a building, a lot of waste occurs. Okay, 
so on to cheerier things. Um, another um, feed mill that was in town um, was Hunt Barrens, which got started at the foot of C Street in 1921. This is also a Decker photo, but I must have cropped out the, uh, the sign. <clears throat> Marvin Hunt and Carl Behrens gained experience in the feed business by working for G.P. McNair and established their own mill. Hunt and Behrens were inspired by the changes they saw taking place in the animal feed industry, especially the use of vitamins, minerals, and proteins as part of animal nutrition. Here's another... Um, ah! Decker in the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> Decker. Looks like litter. Looks like a little litter. Hunt and Barron saw the need for better feeding rations and improved feeding programs and dedicated their operations to two primary goals customer service and efficiency, and production to keep costs low. And having met with Dan Fagoni, one of the owners of the company, a few months back, I would say that is still their um, motto. Catherine? Yes? If you go back to that image, mm -hmm. which, oh, it's in that one too, but I've seen it in a couple of images now. If you look just to the right of where it says unbearance, is that a big, what kind of tank is that? Do you have Somebody that just told me what that is. It's for gas or natural Usually gas? Usually they like go up and down for gas. Yeah. yeah. It's like a gas. It is. I have never seen, noticed yes. that. And I just, so, oh. it's pretty, pretty, I can't imagine that's, mm -hmm something you'd have today. Yeah. Okay, again. Now, sometimes we get caught up in the buildings and forget that there's people that live there and work there, <laughs> so I wanted to make sure I included these. Um, let's see. Hutton Barons also had um, warehouses, probably not as numerous as G.P. McNear. But this, um, this building is actually sort of still standing. It's on First Street, and it's the one building that with Basin Street, um, you know, they tore down all the warehouses, all but one warehouse on First Street for their development. And this is the one that they kept, but it's not quite recognizable. And unfortunately, somebody has painted over the Hunt and Barrens, the last remnant that would tell you what this building was. Catherine, yes. why did they keep it? Why did they not tear it down? As a concession to uh -huh. the preservationists who were upset. <laughs> <laughs> do they have to maintain it or did they just leave it? Um, well, they, they repurposed it, uh -huh. I would say. So. Adapted for use. I might not go that far. <laughs> I'll leave that to you. You go visit. You tell me. <clears throat> okay, this is a very odd image, and I was hoping uh, Mr. Fagoni would be here to actually bring this item so I could show it to you physically. Uh, not, and it was while talking to him that I found out that Hunt Barons used to have a retail outlet on Keller Street, and. What he had, he found this in his vault, and it's, for anybody who does printing, it's an old method of, of printing. It's actually, they would, I guess, put the photograph on there, sort of burn the image into copper or something. A little out of my league oh, here. one of those metal pictures? Yeah. Like? And then, so then when you'd stamp it, it would come out mm -hmm. correct, or positive. Yeah, I think it's called a plate. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I have, we have yet to find anybody in this day and age who will touch it with a 10-foot pole. Because this is Oh, good. All right. I tried to scan it. But even you can set, even if I reversed it, the, right. it looks like a big blob. But you can see, because do you remember, for the older folks here, Tomasini's when they were on Keller, and, then, that old and later Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that, I mean, that's the same building. So, I thought I'd share that with you. Didn't share that with the people who came in May, so. Um, okay, by 18, 18, by 1947, Hunt and Barons had grown enough so that they needed to relocate, which they did, to their current facility on uh, Lakeville Street. 
Um, during the 50s, both the storage and milling facilities were doubled in size, and by the 1970s, a second mill was constructed that allowed for the flexibility of operating for poultry and dairy feed division separately. Very important distinction. Catherine? Mm -hmm. Is there any, do you know anything about how they, okay, being on a river, you have to deal with humidity and rats and things like that. So all these grain warehouses right on the river, did they have a certain way they had to deal with, with dampness and, and as far as the, these warehouses full of grain? That's an excellent question. I, I don't have the answer to it, but having toured around these buildings, they are neat as a pin. You could eat off the floor, and I wonder if part of that is keeping army of cows and such. Army of cats. Army of cats. But yeah, I'd like to follow up on that one. Also, Hunt and Barons is unique in that a, a large portion of their facility is all wood and has never had a fire. Not gone. <laughs> but they also have one of the earliest sprinkling systems um, Petaluma's ever seen. Um, so here you can see the importance of the, the rail. Um, so not only being on the river, but the rail. And they're currently using the rail for freight. Unfortunately, I don't think I have a picture of that. Okay, another feed merchant was Vonson. Um, as a young man, Vonson worked for the Golden Eagle Milling Company, you see a pattern here, before forming a partnership with William Hickey in 1904. At first, Vonson and Hickey operated a feed and grain and grocery store building in Kentucky, and then occupied a warehouse on First Street. Um, at first, let's see, um, in 1913, Hickey uh, bought out, or excuse me, Vonson left the business and it just became M. Vonson and Company. And Vonson had this building um, designed by Brainerd Jones on the corner of Keller and Western in 1920. And then I say here that it was demolished in 1960. And then, so often the case, not just in Petaluma, but other, well, other places, took 20 years for something to be built on the site. So they had a grain warehouse and outlet in Point Ray Station. Yes. And that's still standing. It is. Great. Um, so here we are at First Street. Um, this would be looking down E, right here. Uh, and these photos were taken from, I didn't put it up here, but they're taken from the John and Christina Schmalley book, uh, Images of America, uh, about the Petaluma and Santa Rosa Railroad. And then here's from the library, you see the back of the Vonson warehouses. And then here you see the old livery stable, and then the more recent Vonson building here. And this would be about where um, Theater Square is, because the garage is here. So this, this building went down as well. Okay, I remember I was going over this today and I got all tangled up. I've got so many dates here. Um, by the time of his death in 1954, and is Linda Hendricks here? No, she wasn't able to make it. So I've been communicating with uh, his granddaughter. Yes? The livery stable, is that the one that's the barn out there years later? Yes. It is. Yeah. Ah, and can you tell me where it was? I'm sorry. So it's on the um, corner. It's where the parking garage at the corner of D and First. first. Right next to the right fire station. station. Yeah, next to the fire station. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so Vonson lives to 1954. Um, and by that point, he had a speed mill at 201 First Street. He had warehouses at 200, 209, and 301 First Street with a retail store at Western and Keller that we saw, a wholesale branch in Eureka, I wonder if that's still standing, and Point Reyes, which is still standing according to Dewey. Where is it? Well, it's where the gas station is. The only one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it looks, it looks okay. just like it. those yep. type of warehouses. Is it being occupied? Yeah, I think there's like a kayak company and then like the gas station. Um, he employed 75 people, again this is at the time of his death, uh, and he had a complete line of feed and grain 
He also carried seeds, bulbs, and gardening supplies, and had a roofing department. In the 1940s, jumping backwards here, um, let's see, he built, I got these out of order here. I know, I love this. Okay. In the 1940s, they built this building here, which is now Rivertown Feed. Now let me go back here. Redwood Rancher. Anybody has them? I want them. These are the coolest um, publications for anybody interested in um, Sonoma County agricultural history. So this one happened to be on Vonson's. Um, let's see. 1959. Anybody know Paul Lewis? Here in the room. Do you recognize that guy? Yeah. That's Paul Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> um, in 1959, he um, had been working for Golden Eagle, and then he bought into Vonson. And at that, in 1966, um, Vonson became Bar Ale. And all was good until 1994 when rail service was cut off to Barrio, and they were forced to relocate a major portion of their business out of Petaluma to Calusa County, where they're still operating. So yeah, you can imagine the train still running um, back in 1994 on the trestle. And here's um, Paul and his son-in-law, Don Lewis, who you probably recognize from uh, Rivertown Feed. Okay. And then uh, what do we have going on here? So the warehouse, this is all that remains of the buildings associated with Vonson. Because, George. Uh, Catherine, at some point, Vonson was Vonson Gym Cup. Hmm. Yeah, I think I I've heard that. How that fit in there. Well, I think Gemco is Golden Eagle Company. Are you no. sure it's not? Golden Eagle, Golden Eagle Milling Company was Gemco, but I actually just came across that researching Little League because there was a Gemco Little League team. <laughs> <laughs> and I think at one time there was thought that Golden Eagle and Bonson would merge, but it, it never occurred. Um, so okay, sort of beating us to death I feel like, but so here's the Bonson. Uh, warehouses that were torn down in 2004. Um, these were associated, uh, this one in particular, with the poultry producers of Central California, which I'm about to talk about. As a, This is the same one, just a different view. Those all came down in 2004. Wasn't that after Bar El burned? Yeah, Bar El burned, the one on the corner, but everything yeah. else um, went away. Okay, but um, this is new for me. Uh, when, when that occurred, another effort to recognize the historic significance of these warehouses was um, this architectural feature that was created sort of to mimic the outline of one of the warehouses. And, um, and there's a, a, a little bit of a park there. And this really doesn't do justice. <laughs> um, but now I encourage you to go down and check it out because what they've done is this. Stop. Okay. You can't see it in this picture, but this area here is this. And it's uh, colored concrete um, that has basically, it took some uh, language from Avonson brochure or something, sort of, again, to reflect back to Watson. Want to know more? Can't imagine it after this. Um, what, as a part of the, the requirement for when the warehouses came down, um, they were to be recorded and their history documented. And Diana Painter, a local uh, preservationist, was hired to do that documentation and she produced this incredible report that not only talks about Vonson, but it talks about the whole warehouse district, puts the whole thing in context. It is really a great piece of uh, research. And it's available um, in the library for your <coughs> to be checked out. <coughs> okay. I mentioned briefly the poultry producers of Central California. That They um, were a cooperative that was formed to help 
uh, poultry ranchers. And in Petaluma, they built an amazing structure, which we know now as Dairyman's Feed. And back in 2008, I met with the manager of Dairyman's Feed, Roger Bain, who's not there any longer, and he was amazingly generous. He had in his vault, or their vault, a scrap, a photo album that documents the entire construction of those silos and the feed mill. Um, not only photographs, but typed captions? What more could you want? I was excited. So, the light, so he loaned those to me, which is a miracle in itself, and um, allowed me to scan all the images for the library, and then I returned him the original. So at the library, we probably have about 75 images documenting the, the construction, and I'm just going to show you a handful here. <clears throat> and what's great, not only do they document the construction of the buildings themselves, but they've got all these great um, views of what's going on around um, the, the mill. So again, here we have Washington Street. This is Golden Eagle Milling Company all the way to the river. So this entire thing is Golden Eagle. Here's Water Street. Here's you know going around into the Turning Basin. And then we've got uh, G.P. McNear over here. And then this is everything on the other side of Washington Street. Where, well, they're not new anymore, but there's that large apartment complex, and their Freedmen's used to be over in this area way back when. So again, like that Petaluma incubator photo, this is a lot of activity um, going on in Petaluma, in the, all the way into the 30s. Catherine, I wonder, mm -hmm. did, did they see the negatives also? Did they have negatives? I don't know that. But it's amazing. I mean, Scott, you're... Photographer. I mean, the film, I mean, it held, held up so well. Um, other sources for photos, Library of Congress, can't really beat that. Um, here's the building once it's completed in 1938. Um, to give you some numbers that will astound you. This building was constructed for $500,000. <laughs> Had a storage capacity of 25,000 tons and a green elevator measuring 170 feet that eclipsed all other buildings in Petaluma. John, John Thompson of Jones had a slogger construction company of Kansas City, Missouri was the building supervisor. Um, the, the plant itself was strategically located next to the Petaluma River and it, like Golden Eagle Milling Company, it had spur lines. You can kind of just barely see the train there. Um, so that again, they could ship out by train um, using both the North Pacific and the Petaluma and Santa Rosa Railways. The co-op went bankrupt in 1964 and the plant set vacant until 1982. when Dairyman's Feed moved their entire operation from 256 Petaluma Boulevard North to the, what again was the poultry producers of Central California plant in 1989. And I found this so fascinating that what we, what is this, Kodiak Jacks? Uh, <laughs> used to be Dairyman's Feed and it kind of makes sense because if you look behind it, there's a lot of space there. Um, so they move over in 1989 to this facility, and what did I want to say here? Oh, despite their name, actually their largest uh, customers are uh, poultry related, but they do do both poultry and um, dairy feed. Okay, quickly, other feed mills um, still in operation. R.O. Shelling at the corner of Magnolia and Petaluma Boulevard North. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have much to work with, so when I saw this picture, I thought I'd have to add it. Um, oh, let's go back to Shelling first. Hang on. Um, so Rudolph Shelling established his feed mill at the corner of Magnolia and Petaluma Boulevard North in 1948. 
He died in 1985, but the business continues to operate today. Which is amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. Um, and then we also have Barless Feed, which is on Bailey. And this was started in the 1930s by Max Barless and later managed by his sons Leon, Izzy, and Jaime. And here's the facility. A smaller scale than some of the others we've been looking at. Okay, again, people. Uh, so now we're going to switch topics, or switch, we're now we're going to get to hatcheries. <laughs> So who knows these people? I do. <laughs> my neighbor. All right. That's so great. Um, <clears throat> so as mentioned earlier, Christopher Nissen is credited with in inventing the world's first commercial hatchery, founded in 1898. This was just the beginning. Hatcheries are something you can easily take a day to talk about. But here, in just a few minutes, so I've decided to uh, show a few key buildings, some that you're familiar with, some maybe not. Must Hatch um, was established in 1898 by Alphonse Bork, who fabricated incubators of his own design, so competition for Bice. Um, what's on the green? That's kale. Kale for the chickens. And this would be just, okay, we'll jump ahead. It's this site. This plant burned down. Come on. Oh, it helps if I push the right button. Okay. It burned down in the 20s, in 1923, and, and destroyed the entire operation, including 612 incubators. Wow. Doesn't say how many chickens. Um, then um, Leo Bork, Alphonse's son, had this building constructed. Where is that? This is on 7th and F. Yes. Um, as I've said here, designed by Brainerd Jones. Now you can see we're getting into some architectural style here. Sort of Mediterranean revival. Yeah. Local um, contractor Morris Fredericks involved. Uh, Catherine? Yes. I used to babysit the board. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I hate to say this, but um, the, the original Burke, the father, uh -huh. invented a way of shipping chicks that they could survive three days on their own, whatever chicks do. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that opened up a whole new industry. Wow. And then he passed that on to his son. He was the one that I babysit. I didn't babysit him, maybe he did. Okay. <laughs> and the original board went to uh, South America. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, the story was he died in the Amazon. He fell in the Amazon. Oh. But in this one, uh, that was what made them famous. Okay. They could ship these chicks that could not survive for three days on their own, whatever chicks survive. Right. That it wasn't possible before they came up with the magic. Oh so everybody, this is Millie King and um, Wealth of Knowledge. She's also often, um, what are you doing, walking tours anymore for the museum? No, I'm retired. She's retired. <laughs> but, kid, but Barbara sitting next to her still does. And Wealth of Knowledge and, and are great. So Millie occasionally gets out. So if you have a chance, yeah. you should take, a, take her up on it. So thank you for that information. Yeah. Now the. Now they also, didn't they live on D Street? D and, and Brown? Mm -hmm. A D, yeah. yeah. On that big pink house in the corner. Of right, Brown that the Lunabuses live yeah. in now? Okay. So I gotta find out with chicks how they survived. I don't think I wanna know. <laughs> <laughs> um, some close up thought, showed up, photos. And this is kind of interesting. This is a hollow tile, so I, I don't know if they chose this because it was built later, or because, although it doesn't look like it, because it's here in this picture, um, or not quite as visible to the public. Um, in case you doubted whether I <laughs> had that information correct. And at least as of May, when I took this picture, there was space available. 
this was handy too because our last lecture series was partially sponsored by Century 21. So. <laughs> what the art center in one of those buildings? Yeah, there's I think some artists have studios in there. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, it's a great space. Another hatchery you're probably familiar with of some style is the Paleman Hatchery on Petaluma Boulevard North, uh, built in. The hatchery itself was founded in 1917, but this building was constructed in 1927. In the 1950s, they had a capacity of um, four, let's see what I wrote here. In the early 1950s, the business had two 40,000 capacity hatcheries. The company pioneered turkey incubation. Uh, oh, we also have a... Uh, space available. Yeah. Yeah. So again, and the reason I'm kind of emphasizing this is to show that these, these buildings are being used for, um, if they're not agriculturally, they're still being used for something. Lasher Hatchery, probably familiar with this, um, constructed in 1917 and really hasn't changed a whole lot. What I love, I mean, you, the sign, the, this is still there and the lettering here is still visible. Um, now it's a, a, a cake gallery. Morgan Manufacturing on um, Second and H used to be King's Hatchery. And here again you see the use of the uh, hollow brick. This used to be, it also, besides King, it was also known as Vestal Hatchery. Um, and remained a hatchery until the 1960s when it became Morgan Manufacturing. And I was talking to the owner, Mr. Palmgren, of Morgan Manufacturing a while back, and he was telling me that for a period of time, half the building was used for storage for the library before they moved oh, wow. to their current, current location. Now, when you say hollow brick, what does that mean? It's the um, hollow Yeah, they're not <laughs> solid basically. It's, it's not they're... solid all the way through. It's, oh, it's okay. It's got a facing on it's all of them. Okay, okay. The facades are in there. I, I have a feeling it was decorative yet less expensive and non-structural. So it's a facing. Yes. Although you'd still have the same thing. I mean, the museum is a brick building with wood frame. So, but those sure. bricks are solid. Yes, George, you probably know the answer. Some kinds of hollow brick might allow for structural steel. Okay. So it would be structural. How can you tell by looking at it? You just, you just, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you knock on it and it has more of a hollow sound to it. Bigger, too. Yeah, bigger. Dimensions are bigger. Dimensions are bigger. Fences are bigger. Finish is different. It's not less porous. This is great stuff. We've got walking material, walking tour material here. Bundesen Hatchery. Um, this building hasn't changed a whole lot. Even I appreciate that they kept the lettering pretty similar to that. Um, oh, and then we have Paul Bundeson here. Um, check my head. Okay. So recent graduates of Cal Poly. Can I interrupt for a minute? Yes. Millie might remember the little hatchery on Baker Street. What was the name of was that? Was it White? On Baker. Is that the White Hatchery? Uh, it's that little remember. brick building between um, between Stanley and, and oh. Washington Street. You know what that yeah, I know what you're talking about. That it's a different name. Yeah. 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 I'll go check it out. Is it still Stanley? I think it is. Because there was the White Baker. Yeah. White Baker. I don't think white it was hatchery. White. No, it's not White. Because that was off the no, It was a very, very small. I think it's still there. I think it is too, but it hasn't been an hatchery. Okay. I'll tell you a story about it next time I see it. So Paul and his brother Herb were brothers, and they both went to Cal Poly, where they majored in poultry husbandry, and then they came back and they started um, a hatchery in 1951, buying this building from um, Lewis Clark. Okay, hatcheries that you may not know of. 
Oak Hill Hatchery, which is up off of, uh, it's next to Oak Hill Park and on Pleasant Street. And these were the best pictures I could get. <laughs> is that, how's that being used now? It's um, a residence, actually. But it has been everything under the sun, including, I think, um, army supply store, um, printing. Um, but at 1947, it was known as, uh, actually, excuse me, it was established in 1910 by Joel and his son Calvin Doss. And in 1912, it had a capacity of 25 chicks. In 1947, it was Scobbs Hatchery, and in 1950, Adams Hatchery. And then today, it's a, a residence. Down below, we have another Lasher Hatchery on Kent Street, which you gotta take my word for it. <laughs> these are the same buildings. Okay. Ryan winding down here. <coughs> You've all been waiting for dairy. Um, now, when I was first putting this talk together, I thought dairy, I could get all into the dairy ranch and you know the different buildings and the different types of barns you find on the dairy. Not to be the case. I had to narrow it down to just within city limits. So there's the Burdell Creamery, which is just out the door on Lakeville Street and uh, established in 1898. This was uh, established by the Burdell family of Olin Poly Park. Mm -hmm. um, important structure at cold storage facility, electric power plant, a creamery, and an ice plant. Survived the 1906 earthquake. Later it became the Western Refrigerating Company. Just like the people. This is probably what you, most people remember it as, Western Dairy Products, which is what it was in the 1970s. And then current view today, um, 2005, uh, the Sonoma County Historical Society gave the owners of this building, uh, Dave Martin and his partner, Nelson, Dave Nelson, is that right? Um, an award for the rehab, of, uh, adaptive reuse of this building. Other side of town, we find the Petaluma Cooperative Creamery, located on Western Avenue and Baker Street. And I have to think, I'm a neighbor to this creamery, and maybe that's having some influence over me. Uh, established in 1914 uh, by 33 dairymen, led by Lakeville rancher Silvio Gambanini. Uh, six employees initially were put on the payroll that produced uh, a million and a half pounds of butter along with sweet cream, milk, and chicken feed during the cooperative's first year. The Clover brand name was established in 1916 and by 1920 membership in this cooperative had grown by 258. Butter project production jumped to two million pounds a year. As production increased, so did the number of additions to the building. And I just like, it's the same building twice, but um, I couldn't decide which one to use. Um, this, the office um, that still stands today, was constructed in 1918. Again, Brainerd Jones was the architect. Um, throughout the years, more additions occurred. Again, I was able to use insurance maps to to follow that um, expansion so that it eventually the creamery took up the entire block between Upham, Baker, Western, and English Street, as it does today. And actually, it's jumped over. It's over on this side of Baker, too. <clears throat> and again, if you're really into this, these are great because it, I mean, it gives you every single process that is occurring um, in those buildings. 1975, there was a fire. And you know, this is the only picture I could find, and it was the fire department. today. You did? Yeah. Where? Oh. Okay. <laughs> 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 I was going to say eBay. I was going to you, I knew I had some of it. So, unfortunately, our house is not in this picture. Um, <laughs> pretty devastating. And the fire basically destroyed the drying, evaporating, and butter making plants 
um, excuse me, um, that was all that remained, was the drying, evaporating, and butter making plants, everything else. The refrigerating plant, what's that? When was this? 1975. So, they're kind of grappling with what to do, um, and by 1977, you know, whether to rebuild or, but by 1977, um, a decision was made, and Jean Benedetti, the cooperatives manager, along with employees John Markison, Bill Van Dam, Paul Ross, Dan Benedetti, who was Jean's, one of Jean's sons, and Gary M., purchased the Clover brand name, very important, as well as the wholesale and retail distribution business from the cooperative, and then they merged, or they bought out the Stornetta Brothers in Napa, so that's how you get Clover Stornetta Farms, another subject. So here we have, <laughs> um, here we have Clover Stornetta today. That's my mother. <laughs> she supports me in all these endeavors, so I want to include her. And then meanwhile, it wasn't like the cooperative just went away. Um, they just kind of narrowed their their line of products to um, to just cheese and butter. And now um, they were the California Cooperative, not just Petaluma Cooperative. And you can't see it very well, um, but there's the old California Gold um, emblem up there. And they continued on until 1998, until the Dairy Farmers of America purchased them and then closed the plant in 2004. But now, it's kind of gotten a new life, thanks to Larry Peter, who manufactures dried milk products and produces Spring Hill Jersey cheese, and lattes, and coffee, and sandwiches, <laughs> and ice cream. <laughs> Very good ice cream. Okay. Um, I could just go on and on, and there's so many things I left out. The chicken pharmacy. You know, we had an apple vinegar company, which was, um, this would be about where Jericho is today. And before there was Jericho, if I'm not mistaken, it was Pioneer Shell Company, um, part of our agriculture a way of life. We had Kresge's Manufacturing, which is now um, Aquas. You know, that's another place where they made Bruder stoves. Do you know another where the thing. oyster shell company got their shells from? I think from just the same place Jericho was. Oops. Um, I know it seems to me that there was like a, a creamery or a dairy on just about every corner. Here's a couple. You might recognize this building over here. That's Marvin's what used to be Marvin's. This is still, now it's a house. It's been covered with trees. That's Chandler. Yeah, so that, but the building's still there. Where's that located? <laughs> On the boulevard at about Kent, I think. Oh. And I don't know about the Sunny Slope Dairy. I could have included some of the, you know, ancillary businesses. You can't have ag without a way to get rid of the animals. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to say that. The Royal Tallow Plant, which is now Rocky the Dog Park. Right. Well, about it's, it's like uh, been um, destroyed, but the property still. I don't know if we're trying to excavate all the hazardous stuff, uh, but it is right next to Hawk Park. Okay. On the way in. Yeah. And this isn't exactly what I call an architectural gem, <laughs> but <laughs> and I was hoping the board justice would be here. But I love this building. I mean, this is. It's unambiguous. <laughs> but the sign! I mean, I just, you could go a whole thing on just signs. I mean, there, somebody took some real care in, in doing that. They didn't go down to Kinko's and whip out a banner and stick it up there. And they took it to the next step. <laughs> yes. I love driving by this. And I went and when I took a picture today, a local artist, Warren Purcell, is the one who painted the sign. <laughs> And of course, who's the original farmer in Petaluma? <laughs> General Vallejo. But I'll leave that for you to go visit. Art. Finally, we're in an art gallery. 
Um, Ansel Adams took notice of us uh, back in 1954. Um, this is from a book. I scan it out of a book. It's probably some copyright issue, but um, you can get the, the book from the library if you like, or off eBay like I did. Then our own Ansel Adams, Scott Hess. 